And it is very, very dangerous not to understand the origin and the claims of guardianship. Now, we included in the 12 presumptions, and I want to make clear what we mean here in terms of uh, the guardians. Now, for anyone who's on the call and has been missing what we're saying, we're now looking at Article 326 of Positive Law, uh, Guardians Board Council. I'm mindful of the time and I'm mindful of how many words I need to get through. So if I paraphrase, uh, please bear with me. So let's start with Canon 3363 and what do we mean by Board of Guardians? Well, the Board of Guardians, later known as the Guardian Committee and simply as the Council of a County or Borough, is a formal geographically bound body constituted by various parties granting certain legal authority and duty of care to its elected and appointed members for the physical, mental, personal and property interests of others now commonly called wards. Now, in most Western nations today, the Board of Guardians is effectively the town, city, county or borough council. All right. Now, in 1834, when British Parliament introduced the Poor Law Amendment Act, which reorganised the Church of England parishes into unions, they created the Board of Poor Law Guardians, or simply the Board of Guardians. But at the same time, they uh, created the concept of the Clerk of Guardians. Now, in 3365, we clarify what we mean by the Clerk of Guardians because this is extremely important. This is at the heart of understanding the role of the clerk whenever you go to a magistrate's court. Now, the Clerk of the Peace was an ancient role in England and it was, the role was around from at least the late 13th century. What they did was that they took the Clerk of Peace and they added to that role the powers of the Clerk of the Guardians. So the Clerk of the Peace also became the Clerk of the Guardians from 1836. But they also added additional powers to this clerk role. Not only was the Clerk of the Peace now the Clerk of the Guardians, as well as the Clerk of the Magistrates, I mean the head clerk, but they also became the Registrar of the Court of Record or the Civil Court. So they became responsible for all the records, including your birth certificates. When you think of the registrar, now you think of the registrar, this mysterious role. The registrar is the clerk of the magistrates and the clerk of the guardians and the clerk of the peace. And what made the registrar of the court of record particularly important is that in the language of the Acts, as they were promulgated around the world, they said that on the registers that the persons, the poor, were said to be in custody. The person was in custody on account of their names being registered. And when you think about it, you think someone was arrested and held in custody. Well, the flesh might be held in custody, but the name Frank O'Collins under their system is already claimed to be in custody. So when you front up, they're halfway there. They already have the name in custody. They only need to, to convince the body to go into custody. Now, from 1871 onwards, the Board of Guardians and the Clerk of Guardians were granted even more guardian responsibilities when they created the concept of districts called sanitary districts governed by sanitary authority responsible for various health matters. And then later, in 1986, the Clerk of Guardians and the Board of Guardians also got infants. So let's recap now that by this stage of the 19th century. The Clerk of Guardians and the Board of Guardians now held authority over the poor, the insane and minors, which pretty much covers uh, what they can claim you as being. You're either going to be a pauper, you're either going to be insane or a minor and they've got you. Now, significantly, 3367. In 1979, with the Summary Jurisdiction Act, what is the Summary Jurisdiction Act? 
The Summary Jurisdiction Act uh, is the act that defines the powers granted to the clerk of the peace, the clerk of the guardians, the clerk of the magistrate, the registrar of the court of record to affect summary judgment over you when you attend a magistrate or a lower court. Now, when they issued the Summary Jurisdiction Act of 1879, they added to the already extraordinary powers of the clerk the fact that the clerk now was an agent to the clerk of the Privy Council, an agent to the clerk of the Privy Council. Now, if you live in Canada or you live in England or you live in Australia or you live in any country that has any connection to the Commonwealth, and, by the way, if you live in America, the Privy Council is alive and well. In America, the Privy Councils are ultimately the King's Bench in Pennsylvania. And through the King's Bench in Pennsylvania, back to England for the Privy Council. The Privy Council still exists in America and exists for these key powers because now we have the Clerk of the Peace being the Clerk of the Guardians, the Clerk of the Magistrates, the Registrar of the Court of Record, and the Agent as the Clerk of the Privy Council. And that is extraordinary powers that are used against you when you go to a magistrate's court. Now, in 1929, and following that in all other major countries around the world, the concept of the Board of Guardians was abolished. You see this time and time again, they use the word abolished. They don't abolish these powers, they change the office. They change the name. They consolidate. They merge. And so in 1929, the Board of Guardians became the council. When you elect your councillor in a ward, surprise, surprise, a ward of a hospital, when you elect your councillor, they become a guardian. That's who the guardians are. Your commissioners are your guardians. The clerk to the guardians became the clerk of the county council or the town clerk. So it's the town clerk now that is the clerk of the peace, the clerk of the guardians, the clerk of the magistrates, the registrar of the court of record, the registrar of vital statistics, and the clerk, uh, the agent of the clerk of the privy council. And the poor law union simply became the county or the borough. And there's still lots to get through, so we'll, we'll keep going. Canon 3370. Based on the continued claim powers of the clerk and their agents, the magistrate's court is effectively a court of wards and guardians. That's really ultimately what a magistrate court is. It's a court of wards and guardians. With a hearing effectively being either one of two things, an examination or a summary judgment for petty matters limited by cost or penalty. So either you are being examined or if the matter can be handled, will be a summary judgment. And in most cases, because they have the power, they'll have made the judgment before you even arrive. How do you think courts function through so many cases in five or two minutes? The paperwork's already done. And they can do that because the presumption is, unless rebutted, unless rejected, that when you go to a magistrate's court, you accept to be considered a ward. And that's what we say in 3371. Under the presumptions of powers claimed by the clerks, when one attends a Roman law magistrate's court, it is presumed one has consented to be treated as a ward, unless such presumptions are rejected. Now, this is similar to what we saw when we dealt with the high courts, supreme courts and district courts, where if you attend those courts, it is presumed under the 12 presumptions that you are a trustee because those courts are trustee courts. Well, a magistrate's court is a court of wards administered by the guardians. Now, let's just do a quick summary here so we get a handle of what this means. What we're saying is this. It's not simply the source and claims power by statute. 
that is important and relevant to wherever you live in the world. It is the historical providence of the presumption. The presumption and the presumptive powers that we see here come from the same well, the same source, as the settlement birth certificate we just described earlier. The presumption is that you are either a poor, a pauper, effectively a, a slave, a worker bee, that is consenting because you still hold a birth certificate and you have other documentation that is derived from a birth certificate, like a driver's license. You admit to it and so that's one you might be. Or two, you are insane. You're a lunatic. Through the test of insanity, you fail the test of insanity, you're a lunatic, in which case they can treat you and deal with you because they are also guardians of lunatics. Or you're a minor. So the presumptions and the history of how it comes to be, I hope and feel for anyone who is listening to the call now or is listening to this later on, that the material under Article 326 as we describe the role of the guardians, the clerk of the guardians and, and the council and how this all came to be, now makes crystal clear the presumptions behind summary judgments and magistrates' courts. Okay, still lots and lots to get through. So I want to keep going and I hope you find as we go through this that this information is again valuable. That's all to reinforcing what we described last week in terms of their presumptions. Now it's cruel. It is cruel. It's unfair. But in their system, it's one thing to know that it's based on presumptions. But if you don't know what the presumption is, if you don't know what they would consider the magic words, the presumption is not unrebutted and stands. So this is key. You'll hear people say, it's all presumptions, it's all rubbish. Yes, it's all rubbish. It's all corruption. It is corruption. But the trick is this to them. You need to know the provenance of the presumption. You need to know what the presumption is in order to rebut it. And it's the old stories of Hollywood public notice giving us, if you don't know the magic word, the door doesn't open. If you don't know the magic handshake, the deal's not sealed. If you don't know the magic uh, button to press, the door will not open. And that is exactly how the law is modelled, the Roman courts is modelled today. Okay, just quickly, we'll cover through uh, Article 327 on sanity. I won't spend a lot of time on this because given the time, I'm going to run out of time. But I want to mention this in terms of sanity on Article 327. I want to show you on that, if you have time, to go through and have a look at some of the presumptions behind sanity. The concept of sanity, and in fact, in their system, it's not sanity that they test, but it is the test of insanity they test, called non compus mentis. But I want you to have a look at that, because I do know that the calling of psych evaluations and the use of sanity is still one of the sharp, sticks that are continuing to use against people that come to court and show any sign of competence. So I hope you have a chance to go through and review what's listed there under sanity because I do believe that it will help those that are going forward. In the time, I'm sorry, but I won't be able to go through the detail. This is 327. Now in the time left, I want to cover enemy of the state on 328, Prisoner of the State, 329, License, and the Privileged International Government. So if I run a bit over time tonight, I hope all of you are okay with that. I might be a little bit over the hour, but then I will certainly make it up for questions. So let's look at Article 328, Enemy of the State. An enemy of the state also sometimes known as an enemy of the people, is any person or aggregate of persons, society or incorporated entity considered in conflict or war with the policies of 